This is the NeoBooks call for uh, Monday, January 8th, 2024, our first call of the new year. We skipped two calls because it was exactly Christmas Day and it was exactly New Year's Day and it just seemed like resting with family was the thing to do. Uh, if I look strange today, it's because I've got a, a screen, a large screen next to my laptop. My camera is over here and I put the zoom on the big screen and I'm trying to figure out what's the best arrangement for all this. But it means that I'm kind of looking away from you all the time because right now I'm looking at Klaus, right now I'm looking at Rick and uh, it's a little strange. So I may, I may move stuff around for future calls, but this is just an experiment. I may also just pull out an old Logitech camera and hang it on top of the, the big new screen uh, but I do feel my ergonomics are better here, so that's good. Because <laughs> I'm like I'm 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 looking up, and I'm used to sort of crouching over my laptop for decades, so this is good. Uh, anyway, uh, Klaus, any any thoughts or progress on on your manuscript uh, where you've been? Yeah, um, I'm I'm sort of feeling my way along. Um, along the path wherever it wants to take us you know and so uh right now the the um the emphasis is on conveying a need to reduce meat consumption and get consensus around that with uh, within many ngos right because that is uh uh that has been a debate that hasn't that has paralyzed uh, uh, become paralyzed so where groups have conflicting opinions and can't agree on how to move forward that's one thing and then um, the other thing is that I wanted to um, I wanted to get forward move forward and um, create some kind of communication with uh, with the um, students and and uh, the you know college crowd to engage in the menus of change program and so to to make this exciting and and uh, and a fun a fun project to uh, to um, you know, to to explain. The, the, how cuisines from around the world have have uh, you know worked with very little meat and with uh, uh, very small portions of meat, using meat as an ingredient, which is still practiced in most uh, cultures around the world, except in the so-called new worlds, right? Australia, Canada, and United States, where basically, you know, they you had settlers coming in with an abundance of game available. Um, and actually, uh, no agriculture yet that would provide grains and potatoes and so on. So, do you had a an emphasis uh, on meat uh, simply because of its availability, and that sort of anchored itself into our culture here. And so, to change that, uh, to make it you know, fun and and exciting, would be uh, would be a really uh, nice task. Um, and then I'm starting a workshop next week. Uh, where I'm focusing on industry represent on industry. So these are these are senior level uh, CEOs and and uh, members of companies. Uh, everything from farmers to processors, uh, logistics providers, consultants, um, and they they have. Uh, so we have uh, you know, a topic, and I will be moderating a workshop for us to. Uh, to approach sort of meta level uh, issues um, that will help us to stitch together a, an understanding, you know, a, a hypothesis of building a farm to table supply chains uh, up to and including the engagement of the consumer. So we have 13 people. Gene Bellinger joined. He's going oh. to do the systems mapping in the process. Um, yeah, he he's actually uh, uh, quite engaged already, and uh, uh, um, uh, so that uh, so I'm looking I'm looking forward to that, and then we we you know I'm I'm sort of would like to do this OGM style, you know, so where we have one drop in meeting, you know, like our Thursday meeting, 
um, and then spin off from there uh, specialized discussions into very narrow topics like uh, you know, grains, uh, flour, uh, you know, sub subtopics that uh, require uh, a unique path. So that's sort of uh, uh, where I'm at. Um, I like that. I like a bunch of things that you said so many things that I want to go back to a, a couple things. When you started talking about reducing meat consumption, the first thing I thought of was this this sort of uh, terrible false dichotomy between, oh my God, you want us to stop doing something and we like it and and so forth. And the idea that that in America, vegetarian food, it's kind of lousy. Like we have a, I, we, I almost became, a, I'm still an omnivore, but I almost became a vegetarian when we visited Chennai in on the Eastern coast of India. And we, there was a breakfast buffet that had vegetarian and non-vegetarian items in a buffet. And it, I started on the vegetarian side and I never, ever made it over or missed the, the non-veg side because everything was so delicious and different and interesting. And on some of the things, I couldn't tell what grain I was eating. I couldn't tell if it was rice or barley or what. I had no idea. And it was all delicious and remarkably different one from the next. Also, uh, we did a homestay in in uh, 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 Ulaanbaatar uh, in Mongolia. There we go. Um, and we like we got dinner, which was uh, some uh, lamb and rice, and there were just a couple little bits of ram lamb sprinkled in the rice. I was sort of surprised, and then I was like, "Oh, this works just fine." But the proportions were were completely different, and this was mm -hmm. sort of meat frugality out in the middle of the steppe because we were out in the middle of no place, uh, and it was also really interesting for me. And so I love menus of change because it's the Culinary Institute of America saying, "Hey, look, um, here are ways we can eat really, really well um, with better effects for the planet." And I think that's a fabulous thing to to do. So I'm um, I. Uh, I'm interested, partly, all of that plays out into, I can envision a, a call, a, a one or more focus calls of the kind you just described, Klaus, where people talk about, well, how do we convince people to eat better, rather than how do we convince people to eat less meat, uh, and, you know, eat better, and as a consequence, less meat, but here's a path, and here's how, here's what that looks like, uh, here, and here are some great ways to do it, et cetera. Um, a small added note, there's a there's a little startup called Heyday, H-E-Y-D-A-Y, which makes canned food. Um, and they, they'll do like, uh, last night, uh, I, I used one of their cans to make a harissa, chickpeas, and cabbage, and a bunch of other veggies, and I put some pork in there. Um, but they use canning, even though it's very old school and people are avoiding the, the the center of the of supermarkets, but canning is incredibly sustainable because it's highly recyclable. Like like cans make it back into the system, et cetera, et cetera. Extremely non-perishable, so that this thing will last forever. And then their ingredient mix and all that is very sustainable. So they're trying to get funding. They're they're an OVF uh, company, which is the Oregon Venture Fund, which is a, a company that April's an investor in and an active participant. She will join and do due diligence calls and all that. It's a, it's almost like a crowdsourced uh, venture fund. Uh, but I but I say all that because there are companies out there that are trying to get more attention for doing the right thing within the system. <laughs> oh it's it's internet connection well we'll just have to chat about what he was e talking about <laughs> Stuart, you were you were wanting yeah to say I, know, I i i have something to say but i want jerry i want jerry to hear it also and let's trust that he'll be back although you know this may be a um uh 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 prescient way of seeing our future <laughs> oh he's he's coming on <laughs> yeah He's coming on on a different channel is, here. Is he coming on a different channel? There we go. Well, yeah. There we go. He's left his he's left his old self behind. <laughs> I know. Um, so our power went out completely. I'm just dialing in on my cell phone now. But okay. we lost we lost all juice here. Really? Okay. Oh dear. Yeah. So, yeah. So what I want <clears throat> what I wanted to say, and I showed up a few minutes late, so I'm not sure of the context, but I'll jump in to the specifics that we're talking about. Um, you know, my own experience, I was actually a, a vegetarian from age, you know, from my mid twenties to mid thirties. Um, and 
And somewhere around my mid thirties, um, I was introduced to a community and somebody in this community said to me, you know, you seem to have a lot of mucus in your system. If you did a citrus fast, you could get rid of that. Well, citrus fast, as it turns out, the, the core of this community was, it was a raw food community. Uh, it was an Essene diet, which is the diet that supposedly Jesus ate. But the, the, what I wanted to say, and this picks up on what Jerry was saying, um, they used sprouted and fermented sauces for raw food. And whenever I would go over to the kind of clubhouse where people would eat, and, and the center of it was a guy who survived his, um, prost not prostate cancer, but a cancer that's very virulent. It usually takes people out very quick. He lasted like 10 years on his raw food diet. But anyway, yeah. whenever I would go over and partake of these sauces, I would leave there after a meal and wonder what kind of drugs I was on. I mean, it was just, <laughs> it was just absolutely amazing and tasty um, and tasty. And I have leaned towards, um, you know, more and more vegetarian as I have um, grown through the years. Um, and I love to cook vegetarian. Um, and yeah, there's delicious vegetarian food. Only because my acupuncturist um, suggested it and I found that it has value. <clears throat> Will I have a steak once in a while because of the blood condition that I have? Um, um, so yeah, that's one of the key pieces, I think, to the whole movement, to getting people to think differently um, about food. Even, you know, an example would be, um, I forget what they're calling it. McDonald's has got some kind of a, a new menu, aside from just, um, uh, you know, um, uh, burgers, there, there's a whole new um, line of food that they're offering. You, you know, Klaus, you probably know more about that than I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Bill Maher had a spook on it because they, uh, they are sort of <laughs> dialing in uh, to to you know young people, uh, fancy names and crazy stuff. Yes, I remember, uh, I remember seeing that. Yeah, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, to your comment, my daughter did some raw choosing, uh, and she ended up with stage four uh, lymphomic cancer. Uh oh, because um, she digested so much glyphosate in the process because uh, our vegetables are just loaded with glyphosate unless you go for organic. And she was a student, she didn't have the money for organic. And uh, so we couldn't figure out what in the world would have caused this very aggressive cancer coming on for her. Um, but we had her clean within 10 weeks by doing a combination of uh, uh, chemo therapy with a supported diet uh, mm -hmm. and so there's a there's a way i don't want to get too deep into it but yeah. there is a way of uh, of aligning your diet uh in support of uh of glyphosate right. um but what we so the reason jesse is here is because uh um we talked about a communication strategy to you know, uh uh actually anybody but maybe preferably younger the younger folks um to get them excited about a, a plant forward way of eating you know with reduced sizes of meat and maybe every once in a while no meat at all in it so jesse do you want to say hi and and uh, talk a little bit about that yeah i would love that thank you um, I missed the beginning, um, but I kind of heard Jerry talk about <clears throat> trying to move away from getting people off of meat, but more um, getting them from the sad diet to what I called the glad, <laughs> sad to glad. And <clears throat> I just, um, plantpoweredapp.com, I'll put it in there right there. Jerry, you're on your phone, so you can um, download it right there, but it just released this weekend. And you'll see the landing page is all about um, trying to get people away from ultra processed foods and into more whole plant based foods, which I call plant, which are plant forward. 
in other words, for plant powered. And it's free to just start the um, onboarding. Oh. You get to choose the foods that you love. And then um, really it's about educating people on how, how to eat a plant-based diet, um, depending and meeting them where they're at. So if they just want to put two more pieces of broccoli on their plate a day, great. That's a win. As long as it's a little bit more than um, they did before. And it's uh, every food has links to videos and education through Dr. Gregor's um, <clears throat> partnership and we are also partnered with Whole Harvest, which is a meal delivery, whole food delivery um, thing that was just suggested to me. And then we became affiliates. So I'm really excited about it. That This is a passion of mine. And I do think um, awareness is the first step. And then um, giving people an opportunity to just taste new foods and diversify what they're used to. Um, that's the next step. And I would just love to have, go ahead. Jesse, would you mind introducing yourself? You may, I, I don't know who you are. Uh, oh, honestly. oh. <laughs> <laughs> hi. Um, so I met Jerry 20 years ago and <laughs> um, through a TED talk, you know, I don't know. He's, um, we, we reconnected a few years ago, just got backed into OGM and um, we've been connecting and I've been on the call a few times. Um, not mm -hmm. a lot enough, enough for you to, to meet you, um, but I own... Um, I would call it a diet and lifestyle um, educational company. Mm -hmm. And we create apps and infographics, anything that people, wellness practitioners need or um, leaders need to help um, people get have a more healthy diet and lifestyle. So this is just an app that was one of many um, offerings that um, I have through a company called Day Balancer. And I'll put the link right here. That's fantastic. You mentioned Dr. Gregor as well. Are you Michael yeah, Gregor, so, I presume? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm very familiar with his work. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all the app is integrated into his video, the videos that he provides and all of the wonderful resources um we're integrating mm -hmm. his his education as well. And uh, um I'll be at the conference in March or April in Seattle and he's gonna be speaking there as well. So fantastic. Yeah, and I wanted to uh, see if we can write a neo book not nugget not focused on Jesse's topic um, and have Jesse frame the the questions and use the AI to assist us in in developing that uh, and then also set up an AI for Jesse herself um, I'm going to interrupt just for a second um, just for a moment I have technical difficulties on my end but all the power went out and then April came up certain that it was a disaster that we needed to call PGE immediately. Uh, and as I was explaining to her that they probably they probably know about it, a text, an automated text came in from PGE saying, we know that the power is out in your area and their estimate is 2 p.m. for repair. So I'm kind of without resources. I don't know that I'll hang out for the rest of the call because I'm not sure that any of my chargers are charged. Uh, and I should probably preserve a little power on my phone in case this gets worse. But anyway, back to our regularly scheduled program. You may need to uh, manage yourselves today more than uh, me sort of doing whatever it is I do uh, on the calls. But uh, I'm excited for this, and I would love to set up something so that we can talk about um, transitioning to different ways of eating. And, and I think that the, so much of that is cultural. Um, I hit an article recently where uh, it was an old article from The New Yorker talking about pizza. And it turned out that Pizza was a new thing in, in, in the United States in like the 50s. We did not eat pizza regularly. Pizza wasn't a cultural thing. We didn't have all these pizza stores everywhere, never mind fast food pizza, cha pizza chains. And so people were sold pizza. And then way, 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 way later were sold um, sushi. And now you can kind of order anything from any place on the planet uh, by calling somebody and, and a human will actually walk up to your door and drop it on your doorstep, which is a little bit crazy and terrible for the planet, I think. Anyway. Um, I, I think it's exciting to do all this kind of stuff and I will uh, lurk for a while and I, I may have to drop off. Thank you. Well, and and well, Jerry, Jerry, I, Jerry, I really would love to have your um, the company you were talking about with the canned foods. I would love to partner. I'm looking for this. is I can't do anything without partnership. So I want to look, mm. look arms and it's, I, I, it's, any introductions. Cool. I will send it to you. Because the reason why is because the behavior change happens. That's my background has been behavior change and it happens in the grocery store when you step into the grocery store. Of course and, it does. Yeah. And so helping people with grocery lists and, and not just the meals, but the grocery list, that's really where I'm going at. 
Exactly. Very briefly, if you go to heydaycanning.com, I can't use the chat right now very easily. Uh, heyday with an H-E-Y. So heydaycanning.com oh, okay. is the URL. And thank you. Uh, more later. Yay, thank you. Uh, Rick, Jerry, before, you know, about you know, I know I just, you, you just triggered me because it so happened when I was at the World Expo in Dubai, they had lots of charging stations around because you'd walk around using your phone and it would run out. And then I thought, this is silly. It was a great idea. But um, so when I was there, I actually picked up two extra batteries that I charged for the event rather than having to rely on the ch charge. So that was the thing. So I always have two ready on standby for those situations. So uh, from a non-techie to a techie. And I'm I'm trying to remember where the hell did I put my little rechargers because I haven't used them in so long. I'm pretty sure they're drained. Uh, where, like, like right now, if there was an emergency, where would I get two days worth of cell phone power? Right? Like, ah, I'm not sure. So, thank you. I, I well, I'm going to go. Well, that. well, well. There's one other thing as well, and that is you can get these super uh, supercharged batteries that you can jumpstart your car on as well. Which are, uh, so I have one like that available all the time. So I have one like that as well, except it's in the uh, trunk of the car, and I need to pull it out and recharge it and keep it in the house instead of in the car. <laughs> but yeah, anyway. perfect. Uh, back to your regularly scheduled program. <laughs> um, Klaus, anything she, else you want to? Yeah. Uh, sorry. Go ahead. No, what I was going to say is one of the things that I'd like to do on this call today is I, I haven't, you know, been on this call for, I don't know, four or five weeks, something like that. And I'm just wondering where the, the larger project is. And, um, you know where we're going with it um that uh, may open a big can of worms um aside from the lovely discussion about um uh, you know food supply um and of course you know what popped into my mind as as jesse was speaking about you know needing um partners was you know my body of work um which i'm now calling getting to relationship <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. As, as kind of a, a critical piece of the puzzle for my own, you know, musings and meandering. So here we are. Mm -hmm. let, let me take a tiny swing at that before we go back to the specifics that we were just on. Um, and I think you're only opening a tiny tin of anchovies. It's not a big can of worms. Um, and depending on whether you like anchovies or, anchovies or not, I happen to really love, I love anchovies. Mm -hmm. Anchovies are awesome. Uh, <laughs> anyway. Um, so partly, um, there a couple of things are happening in parallel. One of them is Klaus has, uh, in Google docs, a manuscript that is his version one or book one or something like that, that Pete and I need to sort of chunk up and figure out how to turn into a neo book because, um, the neo books idea is that you nuggetize a manuscript, you break it down into smaller pieces, which then live on the web. <clears throat> uh, but that's not a natural way for Klaus or others normally to write because we're all used to things like Word and Google Docs. Um, so there's sort of an intermediate step that Pete and I have to figure out to do uh, in some effective way uh, so that it doesn't take also a whole, a whole mess of time because editing manuscripts is time consuming because you actually have to read and pay attention to everything that you're doing. Uh, then we've had some really nice meta conversations. In fact, I think uh, last call we had, which I guess is three weeks ago, uh, Rick and Pete and I had a lovely go around about neo books and how they work. Uh, and we were kind of exploring the ideas in really nice ways. So we were going way deeper into the, the concept of neo books and figuring out how it all might, uh, might play out. Uh, and I think there's, uh, I think we're inventing the thing as we try to prototype the thing, which is good. It's how things should happen. And I know that as I'm writing nuggets in Obsidian, because I'm writing directly into Obsidian, I've got, I'm hitting all these interesting different questions. Like, how do I think like a neo book? How do I think like a nugget? So that I'm writing repurposable pieces of prose and then other pieces that are ligaments or, or connectors that aren't necessarily repurposable because they're specific for a particular work. But how do I separate those things? How do I link them? What metadata should they have? How do we, and then Pete and I are talking about how do we even attach metadata to a nugget so that it's ignored when you roll up the, the book, but visible when you visit the nugget. If that does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. So that's so that's roughly it. And then we have uh, four, four maybe five kind of manuscripts in progress. 
uh, and so far as you would consider what you're, you've been in the conversation, so I consider yours as one of them. Yeah. Uh, Rick, Rick has his, uh, Klaus has his, I'm working on a design from trust, uh, and then sort of intersections with the potential other, other Neo books, which is one of the Neo books ideas is, hey, uh, every book doesn't have to have all the unique content. You could share some nuggets across books and thereby make a collection of intertwined things, including books that other people write that disagree with your book or take it in new directions by, you know, reusing some of the nuggets, but doing something very different with them, for example. And that's in the future, but that's kind of where we're heading. Um, Pete and I have a bunch of work to do at some point, uh, figuring out how to roll out a manuscript that's ready to go, that's nuggetized into an EPUB format. And that that we're, we're sort of looking at, and we every now and then we'll have a call where we talk about the infrastructure needed to do that. Anybody else with thoughts or comments about the state of the project or additions? That's a great update, Jerry. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, I would I, I would add a maybe slightly different perspective. It just so happens I just finished the book, The Myth of Normal, and you know, reading more about uh, Graham Maté's <laughs> life work. Um, a very interesting character. I mean, he took ten years to write that book. And, you know, if you think of the trajectory of what most people do, if you've written books, you know what it's like. You know, you spend a year or two, whatever the length of time, you 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 curate this content. And then, you know, after that, it's all about marketing. Can you get the message out? And I, I just would like to implode that style of authorship in terms of thinking about how can it be more generative in that you're co-opting other people into the process so that it's a constant evolving process and the ownership, the notion of plagiarism, it's very topical, but, you know, the, the notion of plagiarism is very much framed from an individualistic perspective. And, you know, if you're in the commons, you know, then the notion of individual ownership of information becomes sort of mute because, you know, people are going to copy and borrow things and reframe it, give it different words, and they're saying the same things. Um, but it's really about how to create a learning community. And how can you combine the new book idea with something that is a book without end? Yes. The, because wicked problems, you know, we're never going to solve them, but we might make them less problematic. Less nasty, even better less wicked. Still, <laughs> less wicked, and maybe actually do good. So I, I, I really think this calls for a, a complete transformation in the whole way we think about collaborative and transformational learning. I'm not even sure what that is yet or how it manifests, but I certainly have an idea about the way it needs to evolve, which is very, it's antithetical to everything you do in academia, which is where I came from. So, um, Rick, I love that. And thank you also for grounding me in the actual purpose of the Neobooks, because the book artifacts of the Neobooks projects are shiny objects that are bait for people to come yeah. into the project and jump into exactly. the thing you just described. Because re rethinking how science, uh, you know, research, uh, manufacturing, yeah. everything else actually happens. And the other the other quick thing is, what's the platform for doing that on? So, for example, I mean, I'm a newbie to Discord, but new Discord does have some functionalities to it that lends itself to it, but it's not designed, from what I can see, for that purpose. Um, and so how do you create this sort of, um, you know, this sort of knowledge framework system where people can come in and co-opt and, and connect and, you know, elaborate or, you know, whatever. I mean, it's really creating an innovation and uh, improvisation stage where people yeah. can come in and enter into the flow states and start discovering things other people may have discovered or they've discovered something completely new and it's you know it's it's it's, it's just a complete generative environment uh, very briefly without getting too geeky um discord alongside instagram uh, our mattermost thing that's like slack and a, a bunch of other possible platforms are all flow platforms instead of stock platforms meaning there's a stream there's a flow there's an ongoing yeah. flow of conversation yeah. right exactly huh? Sometimes if you miss an, a piece of, of that conversation, it's just gone because you, you'll never find it. Sometimes you can scroll back up and see the whole conversation like you can on Slack slash Mattermost. Um, but none of them really help you curate a body of work the way Wikipedia or wikis do. That's, that's why Pete and I are in love with wikis, is that wikis are, are sort of 
static, uh, collect, static collective social works that get better over mm-hmm. time. Yeah, and exactly. hen- hen- hence his efforts with Massive Wiki to emulate a wiki using markdown files, which are brutally simple, <laughs> almost plain text files. They're just a, they're just a notch above plain text files um, on GitHub, which is a public repository of files. And then mm-hmm. playing with that, playing with that as building blocks and then doing something above that, 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 that starts to look like the more complicated scenario you just painted. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's the reason why we're using these primitive building blocks that make writing a bit more awkward. Mm-hmm. Well, so, I, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Stu. Sorry. Thank you, uh, Klaus. So a few thoughts. So um, in some sense, um, Gabor Mate's book was, um, <laughs> here's everything I know. <laughs> I mean, it's a, you know, it's a 500 page book. Here's, here's everything I know, everything I've learned. And I was able to put it under this umbrella. Um, mm-hmm. you know, Which of his books are you referring to now? The, the most recent normal, normalcy. There is no nor- yeah, normal. The myth, yeah. The myth of normal. The myth of normal. The myth, the yeah, thank myth, you. The myth of normal. Um, and in some way, the, the, the neo book book manuscript I'm working on is 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 follows that principle. It's like I've taken three different aspects of my own work and put it together um, because I think that coherent whole of getting to relationship working title is all about collaboration. It's all about how is it that we can effectively speak to each other. How is it that mm-hmm. we can maintain relationship because that's at the core. Um, I co-authored a book. This is not a new concept, by the way. Um, Mm -hmm. When I co-authored Collaboration 2.0, 2008, somewhere in that that time frame, um, or 2003, I can't remember, it was a response to the Silicon Valley's desire to cut down on real estate costs and have people work from home. Um, I never thought that it would have as much relevance till we hit COVID. Um, And Silicon Valley has to some degree, you know, abandoned that as a a huge mantra. Um, But during that period of time, there was somebody in the Valley, and I can't remember who it was who was talking about, what they called a um, a living book, which is essentially mm-hmm. what, right. you know what the neo book concept is a living a living book. Um, we never we never took that further um, because my collaborator was just I didn't want to work with him. <laughs> this terrible my co author. That's a that's a that's a separate story, and that happens. whole different story, and that happens. Um, the notion of ownership and IP concerns um, is something that I personally had let go of a long time ago. You know, mm-hmm. I want people using it. I don't care about ownership or attribution or any of that stuff. You know, it might seem antithetical for an attorney to to think that way, but that's just just my thinking. The stuff happened to come through me, you know, you think it's valuable, great, um, use it. That's why I was a little, I was a little, um, uh, you know, tweaked when, um, um, you know, the New York Times, the news of the New York Times lawsuit against, uh, I don't know, whoever it was, Microsoft, I think, for plagiarism, for using some of their content um, to build their, uh, you know, um, um um ai um algorithms um the writing process itself and this is where the neo book concept i think is so so wonderful the writing process is a is a is and class i'm sure you've experienced this it's a way of clarifying your own your ideas. Exactly. You know, exactly. When you when you when you start to use words in a written format, it makes you focus. <laughs> Especially mm-hmm. something that other people are going to see 
it makes you focus and, and it, it clarifies um, your own ideas. So the idea of having collaborations around that is beautiful because that's a way of, of growing a particular body of content from the different perspectives that different people um, are going to bring to it. Um, so I just wanted to share those 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 pieces. Mm -hmm. Love that. Thank you. Anybody mm -hmm. else? Yeah, so I, I found that uh, exactly you know, what Stuart is saying, um, but then also amplified by the use of AI, you know, to go into a specific topic and then realizing that uh, my assumptions uh, wouldn't be cooperated, right? And uh, forcing me to go deeper into something and coming up with stuff I would have never thought of on my own. So that mm -hmm. really uh, is an accelerator that is just incredible. I could have not written what I was was writing there without that support. No. I was just telling that story, Klaus, uh, to a guy who's on the um, AI team at Meta um, at dinner last night. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the story so, of how you used AI, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that just that just pushed it into a completely different field, and in the process, you know, of going from chapter to chapter, um, it spawned new new ways of thinking. Uh, so, remember when we, we, I mean, we we sort of jointly shaped the first volume, uh, and then Bill came in and said, "This is I don't know what to do with this. This is three books. It's not one book." And then. So that brought me on, no, no, it's one book and there's a purpose behind, you know, these three chapters. So let's put an umbrella over it and then uh, and then see here, here are the, uh, uh, here's the storyline, right? Um, so that's one thing that's, that's very regenerative. But then the other thing is, so I just started this newsletter and that's how I apply the nuggets, you know, the individual components because the book itself is sort of overwhelming. I mean, it's just really, really requires someone to sit down and really think this, think about. There's so much depth in it because of the AI component, you know, that adds you know so much uh, uh, content. But when you put it into a newsletter, then you can focus on just like one topic, you know, and really explore that one topic uh, and build it, you know. So the the I'm I'm sort of applying CLU thought process in the way I'm building these newsletters because I want to start, you know, at the basic and then go into more and more depth and uh, refinement towards the idea of the uh, a neo book, which is really to say, you know, our food uh, is at the base of the pyramid. You know, it's a very basic need and it's in trouble and it's causing. Uh, no, a lot of damage to the environment, to human health, and so on. So it must change. Uh, but recognizing this is a deeply emotional topic, and uh, people are very attached to you know, their way of living, which is much expressed through food. When you think every holiday, right, has a certain recipe attached to it. So, mm -hmm. so how do you engage here in ways where uh, people, on their own volition, Right, start thinking differently about food. So uh, that's why I'm bringing in things like uh, theory U and spiral dynamics uh, to uh, uh, to open up uh, uh, to open up a very specific language. And I mean, I literally can go to ChatGPT and say, uh, translate this into an orange blue spectrum, and it does it. Uh, it's just crazy. Now. My knowledge goes to knowing what spiral dynamics is is doing, but to, to, to actually execute on it, I mean, I couldn't do this, right? So, so, um, so for that for that purpose, uh, uh, yeah, uh, AI is is super important. I actually developed a GPT now, uh, and Chat uh, ChatGPT just came out with um, a way to commercialize your GPT. Did you see that? Mm -hmm. You know? That just uh, that just sent out uh, uh, an email this week saying, if you have developed uh, a chatbot, uh, you can uh, put it online into a store. They're setting up uh, basically a store where, um, and Jesse, this may be something you want to think about. Uh, you can actually develop a chat GPT 
and and commercialize it in the uh, 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 in the Chat GPT uh, uh, commerce store now, um, and and that could be helping people with you know, uh, uh, intelligence to to, to uh, do what you what you are trying to to develop as a product. So anyway, so so that's that's. Uh, it's a it's a it's a process structure, you know, that that really helps you to build out the story. For someone who has never written a book in his life, like me, <laughs> don't have the training for it and all of this. Uh, um, this has been, you know, this has been a, a pretty amazing ride. Actually, Klaus, on a previous call, I th you weren't there. I think when we brought this up, and I I mentioned this, Jerry was just to hear your story of the book you're doing as, as a way of inspiring other people to do the same. Um, you know, I don't know enough about the story and I thought I'd love to hear it some at some point, you know? Um, but I just want to go back to something that Stuart said about uh, relational process. What, what you triggered for me was a, a, a book that I got involved with editing. This was back in the mid nineties and it was called Partnerships in Healthcare, Transforming Relational Process. And, um, you know, this is one of my first experience of editing a book. And I tell you, it's really painful, <laughs> you know, because you have so many different authors. You're trying to develop a coherence across the different areas. And it, it probably took, I bet you, close to two years to be able to take the synthesis of this conference, ongoing communication with the authors and going back and forth fitting into a regular you know work life um but nonetheless in that process actually is something that i was referring to earlier why why keep it constrained why not have this open so that it's so it's it's really uh um you know extension and elaboration of a prior experience to what i was just talking about so it looks as though jerry may have gone off at that point but anyway i'll put i'll put the link in for that so you can um, you know, but I want to come back to you. We're saying, Stuart, I think the relational process, the relational process in multiple dimensions, relationship to food, it's relationship to nature, it's relationship to, you know, everything. How good, how, you know, what's the quality of our relationships? Duh. You know? And, and at the moment we are in history, okay. It's a, it's an interesting juncture because the culture we've been so much a part of is so much an individualized culture. Exactly. It's, it's the aggrandizement of the individual and everything drives that in terms of the individual success and accomplishment. And here we know that the only way through the morass we're in is by working with others. And that, that, change, exactly. that change of psyche is a, is, is just, you know, it's it's a critical piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. I agree with you totally. Rick, so, what 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 so, are you working on, Rick, for for your neo book? Yeah, well, actually, I was gonna. What I'll do, I'll, I'll share um, a uh, a brief LinkedIn article. Let me just. I'll just put this into the chat, actually, and um, just give me a second here while I pull it up. You know, it's funny because I've been playing around with Dolly and I've been blown away by the visual images that you're able to create with it. I'm, I'm absolutely blown. And people have said, how did you make that? And I says, well, I, you know, you use the prompts and do whatever. And somebody who is, who's a graphic designer said, you know, Rick, you, you've got a hidden talent there. And I says, I don't think so. But anyway, let me show you this. Uh, if you, if you look at this image here if you click on the link you'll see it actually i could share my screen if i got screen share but if you just click on the link and you look at the image there um and um you know the, the title is how my january 6 2024 mark the start date to break the cult trance of mass psychosis burn down authoritarianism and resurrect democracy with equity and um this is sort of not directly right, but it's certainly it's 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 um, it's sort of an adjunct to it. Um, and the idea behind it here is instead of telling people what they should think, I'm asking questions to help them learn how to think, not what to think. And when you make that shift, 
it does change how you write and it's antithetical to a lot of things that are currently being done. So it really requires a mindset, mindset shift from learners' perspectives. And it's really about creating learning communities where people can come together and get involved in generative strategic dialogue and civil discourse. But you have to create a space where people feel safe and you know you don't get involved in, in um, heightened emotional reactivity. Some emotional reactivity is vital because it's very important to understand what triggers you. But when it gets out of hand and it just ends up in dysfunctional polarization, you know, game over. It's just, you know, it's just a battle between different fundamentalist belief systems. Um, so how can we create spaces where people can um, <laughs> learn together, basically? I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting, Rick. One of the, you know, aha moments that I that I think I had this morning or maybe it was yesterday was in the... Um, neo book manuscript, whatever you want to call it, that I'm working on. Um, I, I I've identified like 33, four areas of our social structure that mm -hmm. need attention at the at the present moment. Okay, mm -hmm. but the aha moment for me was, oh, I don't have to solve each one of those, but I no. know I know I pointed. And I pointed at it, and I know there are people out there who have expertise in that area. And to get people cooking on each one of those things, you know, that would be a wonderful, a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, others are way further down the curve than than I. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, what Not I can many do is... to it. Huh? <laughs> Not many. <laughs> Well, for some of these individual things, I I, I think so, Klaus. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. But thank you for that. <laughs> Jesse, why don't you talk a little bit about your plans and and, uh, and where you want to go with this? Um, I think it's all through partnerships. And I've noticed the more and more I'm engaged um, with people like Dr. Krager and Plantricious, um, which certifies um, products that to be plant-based, um, the more and more I'm getting introduced into a circuit, <laughs> if you will. Mm -hmm. And boy, if the more we can help each other, the farther we can go quicker. So it's all through partnership. And I think we all have the same kind of thought process that we're in the commons that we are, um, we're not in it for the money. We have to be sustainable, obviously, with our our mm -hmm. business. But um, yeah, and we're and we're not doing this alone. So I, that's where I'm going. <laughs> what do you What do you see as your target market? Um, we're We're doing A/B testing right now. It seems to be uh, those we're targeting those who are in the uh, sad <laughs> standard American diet. Um, and wanting to to um, just add let me get off some other ultra processed kind of foods and start learning more about um, putting plants on their plates and enjoying them. Um, and then there's the people who are already like in it, like uh, the lifestyle is like vegans who um, understand the impact of every single thing they purchase, and they're a little easier to convert to whole food plant based. But and they're very unhealthy too. A vegan can be very unhealthy, is what I mean. Um, so looking between those two, um, target markets and, and figuring out which one's going to be the best. I don't know yet. Okay. Uh, vegans and vegetarians are kind of the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if you, if you, um, spin this a little bit further down, um, and look into population groups, you know, types of let, let's say students, you know, or um, the type a type of socioeconomic uh, uh, grouping. How would you define that? Um, <clears throat> I think I need some advisement about that because I don't know enough data. I I'd like to start with the data and what does that inform us to to communicate. Yeah. 
I think they're way more, way more smarter than, you know, for some reason I have the most people that are using this app are 50 and older, actually 60 and older. And yeah. Um, And when I asked, uh, did a survey, the the qualitative and quantitative results showed that um, the reason why they just want to lose weight, biggest reason. So Target should um, always talk about the weight. (laughs) And I have infographics on all the those stats, but um, when it comes to younger people, it's more about the environment and and the impact that they're having because um, they haven't had yes a lifelong version of um, eating lifestyles. Well, I don't even know. I can't even tell you that the data will inform me. That's okay. That's great. My thing has been for the longest time trying to reach what I call the Equator Thunberg generation, and I've been hopelessly unsuccessful doing it. But the, when, you, when you think about the passion this group has, right, to go out and protest and uh, and be so vocal about climate change and all it entails, and yet they have no clue about the impact of their personal you know, dietary choices, uh, what, they, what the impact they have on the environment. So I think that I mean that to to reach that group seems to be a worthy uh, a worthy target. Yeah, well, we, just, we, we have to put weight. <laughs> we just have to, we just have to elect Trump, and he'd be the role model for, for all of these things <laughs> that we're talking about. <laughs> the role That's model, funny. The, Im- the imagery, the um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, you reminded me of something. Uh, uh, there's a, a podcast series. That you you may know this person, but I, I haven't followed him a little while. Uh, he's got a podcast called Eat for the Planet. I don't know if you're familiar with that one or not. Um, but he's written a book on it. And, um, I mean, he's certain, you know, I, I haven't listened to his podcast in a while. So, I mean, that might be a partnership arrangement. Um, actually, I was surprised that you said your demographic was 16 above. And, you know, when when Klaus was talking about, you know, the benefits of canned food, what immediately came to mind for me was when I, I, I went to Walmart and I found this can of black beans that was really spicy and it was exceptional. I knew exactly where it was in the store. And I can't remember the brand, but I know where it is in the store. And they stopped st- stocking it. And I just was astounded because that I could eat one can of that and that was the meal for me. And if you think of, of uh, you know, what are the best plant-based, spicy canned foods that students who are busy, who can live very cheaply and eat for the planet, you know? So I don't know if you've got the top 10 most interesting canned foods that you can you can um, rank order or put on offer and say, hey, this this meal will cost you two bucks, you know, um, because the, the, I, I just don't know how good. Because I actually I have a little bit of, um, you know, a bit of a negative thing towards can. I, I shouldn't, but I do because I think fresh is better than can. But can is good, you know. So can you can you can you shed shed any light on on of my request. I think that's a great idea in terms of cost because um, there is a um, a myth that it costs more to go whole food plant-based. <laughs> it's kind of the same if you, it's a wash out and organic also. So, but when you, when you're talking about canned, then, then the conversation just changes. And really it's important about changing the conversation and our our impact by asking the right questions, all conversations change. So that's a really good question. How much does it cost? Yeah, and and most young people now, most students are on AI. You know, um, I mean, it's really the the penetration into the college world of AI is just mm-hmm. astonishing. Yeah. So if you have uh, a tool to share there, I think uh, you know, kids would put it to use. 
Yeah, that's pretty incredible. And also on this segmentation we just talked about, I think AI can really help us to uh, to flesh that out. Stuart, you had something on your mind. No, well, the the um, the thought of how related this is that the idea of you know um, you know how and what we eat, the the lifestyle choices and how that gets reflected in weight tied into the farming piece i mean um boy when we talk about um win 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 it, it it's across the board in terms of the potential mm -hmm. yeah yeah um it's uh it's a challenge that uh, has been has been around for a while. I mean, because it is just so darn emotional you know, and and so tight to your lifestyle and everything. And in some ways, you know, it's a it's a it's a great microcosm to the macrocosm that we're in, because it involves you know corporate profits, it involves change of habits. Um, Da, 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 da. It, it, there it is there there there, there it is mm -hmm. yeah yeah and that's really a good point i already had one of the participants of the workshop that uh, we're starting up next week contact me wanting to make sure um uh how do i frame this it's on so many words that uh the interest of big producers and big uh, you, uh, 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 buyers doesn't get derailed, you know, with too much uh, decentralization and deflection. <laughs> and why this is, I'm I'm just going to moderate the discussion, guys. I'm not going to. Uh... There and 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 there therein is the is the edge or the rub or the challenge that that you know you drop in the economic piece. And it skews it skews everything. Um, and how do we how do we how do we manage the transition of that without creating all the dislocations? Um, yeah. You know, um, a lot of this has to do with mindful eating. Is kind of how I I sure is it. Mm -hmm. And when you sit down at a meal. Um, it's really easy to to think about and plan about the future or ruminate about the past, but where rarely are we practicing presence in our eating habits? And it's a very habitual energy that we carry on um, from generation to generation. Um, so part of my goal is to support the the mental model of sitting down and being with your food so that you really are thinking about it and where it comes from and the impact it has. And I don't wanna take that angle in the beginning of the marketing, but when you're in there, there's a there's a whole section on what to do before a meal, during a meal and after a meal, which borrows a lot of the Buddhism versions of um, presence, but trying to keep it, you know, the secular part is the issue. So just wanting to make it mindfulness about mindfulness. So, but talk about the issues that, of economics and the conversation start changes and those, those, those conversations you're facilitating um, a lot of it is either future tripping or ruminating and rarely do we experience the now and and respecting um the people in front of us like we don't we what like we do with our meals it's just it's not separated why doesn't oh here we go why What's doesn't that? i do uh, no, so you just had this fantastic fireworks go off and yeah mine doesn't want to do it Oh yeah, you have to turn that on, <laughs> and you got to do the heart too, like this. Yeah. How and do you turn it on? Ah, oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> and no. oh, and the, just idea, go. Uh, the idea. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, the idea of making the declaration <laughs> of how are you gonna, how are you going to eat? You know, uh, I'm going to be vegetarian creates that mindfulness around you know when you're when you're eating with friends when you're uh going out to a restaurant that that mindfulness 
uh, becomes more present. Yeah. It is a lifestyle for sure. Sure. Yeah. And the the um, the story how to get there is just hugely flexible um, and, and really has room. You know, it's a it's a big uh, big tent approach because for some people health is everything you now oh. and and healthful uh, uh, minding your own personal health and everything. And people are fascinated with this topic all the time, right? Because because people are basically so sick because so much of the food just makes you sick, and so uh, there is a there is a really uh, keen awareness. Unfortunately. That's where the pharmaceuticals come in and you know, where, where you know, people get preyed on. But it's a huge topic. Uh, yeah. And then for, for others, it's you know, your water, your air, you know, your environment. Um, but I would say if, uh, health is probably the biggest uh, trigger for, for people uh, to change. Yeah, weight. and I would I would actually say weight is bigger than health. Like weight. Yeah. It's really hard to meet people, yes, when they are sick they'll do anything, but it's <laughs> preventative work is really important. And the way that do preventative is kind of like the weight because weight really leads to cancer. A, a lot of the obesity is associated with cancer. So um, by saying, Hey, your weight actually does need to be uh, addressed because if you keep on doing this, you're going to end up potentially having illness, uh, a fear tactic a little bit, but really it comes down to beauty uh, a lot. Yeah, but well, it's an entrance point. It's an entrance point to the conversation. That's fine. I'll take it. So, yeah, Jesse, I, 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 I presume you're familiar with intuitive eating, the way you were talking about. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, that's what I thought. Um, because you know that is not easy to impart to people. Um, but one thing that um. You know, I, I'm I'm a family physician. I was trained in lifestyle medicine. That's how I got to know Michael Greger. Yes. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Please, please Are download you... the app and tell me what you think. <laughs> well, I certainly will. Um, you know, because I used to go to the American, um, you know, College of Lifestyle Medicine fairly frequently, but I've fallen off the radar screen from that. But um, you know, there, the, you're probably familiar with a five-two diet as well. Yeah. which is two days a week, you, you know, you get down to 600 calories. Yeah. And actually, if, you know, that's to me, the, the, one of the, the, even if you fail at it, and I tell people, if you can't do it, it doesn't, but just trying to reduce, it disrupts the, ch the chow down uh, mentality yeah. because you have to become self-conscious of what you're doing, what your impulses are. And then when you start eating, are you doing, can you actually do it mindfully or are you slipping into autopilot? You and know, so Rick, that's you know, actually that's actually how I got involved is because I was learning how to fast and I don't need to lose weight, but it made me more mindful um, to go, oh, what am I supposed to eat before and after a fast? Because mm -hmm. nutrients are important. And then exactly. that down into, yeah. So meet, meeting people at fasting stages and saying, mm, be careful what you eat before and after. That's mm -hmm. good. Good conversation. Well, it's. Well, it, it's funny because when when the five two diet first came out, it came from England, um, and I got to know about it. I don't know how many years ago, twenty years or whatever. And I dis I decided to do it for three months. I didn't need to lose the weight, but I want to say, could I lose ten pounds in that period of time? And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm you know my BMI is just in the upper range of normal, uh, but I thought, can I bring it down? And uh, you know, I actually found it quite easy to do. Um, you know, because I was doing 12 hour shifts and on the day I was doing 12 hour shifts, I just drank lots of fluid. I just had, you know, I eat like a bird throughout the day and I could do it. Um, and I lost 10 pounds in, in three months, but I learned so much more from it than just the weight loss. Um, you know, unless you challenge you, unless you disrupt your patterns of behavior, you do not know what you're up against. Yeah, I do think about nutrients too. So, uh, yeah, when when you do download the app, look at the nutrient guidance, the nutrition guidance, because you add in your your mail, your activity is this, your age is this, your it tells mm. you to ask answer all that, and then it calculates a recommendation that you need to check in with your doctor, obviously, but it starts them to think about it. Exactly. Well, right. actually, just what you go ahead, go ahead, Stuart. No, I was going to say, I think there's a, there's a great story about a. Um, uh, an NFL National Football League player who became a vegan 
and hired a personal chef. And he got a bunch of his teammates to actually sign on to the same diet. And thus proving that you don't need meat protein exactly. to have you know energy and proper nutrition. And, and there you go. And the, the professional high level athletes expending lots of energy had plenty of nutrition from a plant-based diet. Yeah, that's where people really say, well, where am I going to get my proteins? So that's why I created this part of the app. As a plant-based nutrition, I'm certified in plant-based nutrition. That was my first question. And that's the first question everyone else asks of me. So, And, and yeah. going back to my own experience on a raw food diet, I had more energy than I possibly knew what to do with during that period, during that period of time. I was, it was, it was, you know, kind of through the roof. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've forgotten the name of the movie, but the, the movie that Arnold Schwarzenegger was in and talking about his, um, and actual fact, it, it goes back to the gladiators. The gladiators were um, plant-based um, vegetarians. And actually, they've done studies showing that actually people improve their athletic performance if they are on a, and I, I have to go back. I, can, can you remember the name of that movie? I'm, I'm just blanking on the name of it. It came out about 10 years ago, I think. Uh, I'll see if I can find it because I, I, it just lampoons all the sort of uh, misinformation that people have about uh, plant-based diets. Um, let me see if I can find it. I'll let you chat. Get, I'll see if I can find the name of the movie. We need Jerry's brain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was he on a plant-based diet for a bunch of time, Rick? Mm -hmm. Who was that? Sorry. Yeah, no, no, no. now now and I'm now I'm remembering this. He was on a plant plant based diet. Yeah, there's actually a um, YouTube uh, video for athletes that are, uh, and and Arnold Schwarzenegger is one of them who is shared, and he's not gone completely 100, percent but he's right. recognized mm -hmm. as that. Yeah, hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I forgot what it's called. I'll share it. Yeah, the stories the stories are there, but I mean you also um, have to be aware of the industry countering whatever you come out with uh, with uh, you no know, million dollar budgets to get people excited about uh, um, you know getting this highly processed food out. I mean it's actually astounding how uh, distorted uh, our food has become. You know when you go and look at the uh, processed shelves and i mean right now we we, we are importing fresh you know, produce from mexico and south america traditionally you know we, we we would use canned vegetables right until um until refrigeration became so omnipresent and and frozen took uh, another place um but we, we i mean we absolutely have the technology and it's actually maintaining nutrients in the product in the produce better when you flash freeze it right off the field, uh, or uh, even if you can it, um, then when you ship it and it's get it's two weeks old by the time you put it on your plate, you know, that food has lost more nutrients than the uh, than the uh, preservation process will take out. When um, when I had a myeloma diagnosis, um, one of the first thoughts that I had was, so what's what caused this? Because I don't want to perpetuate <laughs> this disease process. I want to stop it. And they don't know. They just talk generally about, you know, toxicity uh, in the environment, in the food supply, in in in. Our, our own um, psyche and the level of energy that that is around. And I just went, yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Absol ab absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Well, just to just to share with you, it's called the Game Changers, and it wasn't that long ago. Yep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank I, you. I, I, was, I was looking it up too, so thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> I was just I mean, the thing is that title is not doesn't isn't memorable because no. it doesn't connect with a message. It's like what what a marketing you know you want to you want a title that you can remember and associate with it. But anyway, I'll 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 put the the link in there. But I thought it was very well done, very well done documentary. Actually, one thing, uh, Jesse, we're just in terms of what you're describing. Um, you know, one of the things that you know, coming from an academic background, and I'm sure you've already been asked these questions, um, and that is, what's the evidence behind supporting the recommendations? I mean, you know, Michael Greger goes to great length. And he always says, um, you know, what's this expression now? Uh, what? Uh, uh, give me the data. facts or yeah. yeah, give me the data or whatever, you know, give me yeah. the evidence, basically. There's yeah. some, he's got a little expression and it's just gone out of my head. But, you know, where's where's the beef, basically? Mm -hmm. Yeah, where's the plants? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I need to so, I mean, mm -hmm. okay, that's fine. I think right. I've got a scoot as well, but uh Thank nice you, nice nice meeting with jessa and, and i'll you. look is that linked to the thing that, did you put it in is that the one yeah just go to uh, plant, plant powered app.com on your phone to, yeah, to yeah. download it and hopefully you'll get through it um and then here's my uh my text number just text me if you get any because i need to know wherever the frustration points are okay that's fine did you oh i see you got it there okay yeah, yeah. And then all you, right once you, Mm -hmm. Once you join, um, uh, use free now as the coupon, and then you'll have a free version. Free now as the coupon. Sorry, what you have to say is what? Use free, free now. now? Yeah, free now. Oh, That's I see. Okay. Fun. All right. All right. Cool. Okay. I'll take a look. All awesome. righty. Okay. Thanks uh, no. for inviting me here. I appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Keep coming. Jesse, uh, stay on for a second. Sure. Let me get some water. I'll be right back. Sure. Bio, bio break. Hi, Klaus. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Bye bye, Stuart. Thanks for, for joining. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so what did I, you think? I love I love the conversation. I always um, <laughs> it's interesting to when when you create new connections, um, you kind of have a have to baseline what everyone knows, so you can know where to start the conversation. So it's great to know that everyone is. Um, already at a certain level and I don't meet many people like that so I'm I'm excited to be in the circle yeah it, and Pete wasn't here today um, yeah but he is a, like my super techie right I mean Pete yes. really <laughs> got us all into the AI and and I mean he's talking about software I don't even want to know about it <laughs> yeah. it's but uh, but Jerry and and Pete I don't know if you had joined the conversation already Jerry gave an gave an, uh, an opening update on um the neo book process and they're going to take the volume 1 that I had written and they're going to process this into a neo book format the way that Jerry has envisioned it okay um so and I don't know what that's going to look like, quite frankly. But uh, you know, they want to to you know work, work it up there, and I'm going to stay through OGM because obviously I couldn't have written this book without Stuart, you know, and 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 uh, and Pete and Jerry yeah. uh, to to supporting it, and they sort of you know helped my thought process you know, all along there. So that's really that's really pretty good. So 
um, how can I how can I assist you uh, to write uh, uh, a nugget you know, to uh, or or then whatever if you want to do your own neo book I mean how to do sort of a foundational piece talking about um, shifting people's thought process into an association of my plate, my health, my climate sort of thing. Um, so your question is how can you help me write something for the neo book? Yeah, so also with the use, uh, but also using specifically uh, chat GPT. Uh -huh. right? So, so the so that that means flipping the way that you think about writing in terms of framing questions. Right, right. Right. So, so the the challenge here. So I have uh, a chat GPT developed that. It's like super deep into anything food and beverage and and uh, agriculture and climate, mm -hmm. right? So you get you get amazing responses depending on the quality of your question. Right, right, yeah. It almost seems like asking or you know defining the questions are more helpful to people than the answers because there's always going to be answers, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I mean, there are always going to be answers, but when you communicate you know, with an audience, you want to put a structure in that that resonates. You know? Yeah. Um, and so... Uh, well, I like mean, one I, of the things I did when, when I worked at Amazon, everything that I created for curriculum always started with a question instead of a, like it would say, and, and, and then you could look at all the list of questions and go, well, I know that up until here. And then I start diving deep and, um, and everything builds on each other. You know, I'm, I'm going down, but it's actually kind of building up. And so uh, a list of questions that are linkable to answers are a, a great way to learn because you could choose and, and it builds on each other. That's, that's the key. Right. So maybe we can play um, and uh, uh, we can get directly onto the chat GPT and, uh, and start inserting you no know, questions and see what comes out uh, and then you know, condense it and uh, see where it takes us. Yeah, let's, let's have a, um, a working meeting or a play brainstorm meeting um, sometime later this week and make it happen. Okay, all right, um, I'm ready. What, what's your calendar look like? I'm pretty open on Friday morning. I have a 1030 on Friday for half an hour. I'm going to be on a call with um, um, I'm talking about the chronic flow, actually, <laughs> for the commons. Uh, um, Tuesday, from... tomorrow, um, actually, tomorrow yeah. would be. Tuesday actually works. Um, are you open at like 10? 10 o'clock is fine. Okay. All right. I'll send you an invite. Okay. Sounds great. Yay. I look forward All to right. it. Very good. Thanks, Jesse. See you later. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.